Okay, well, welcome everyone to one of our Birth Happens presentations and our speaker series. And to, today we're talking to Maria Ramos Bracamontes, who is a local uh, midwife and has been midwifing in the Santa Cruz County in all different capacities. So welcome, Maria. It's so nice to talk to you. So we, just have a, we have a few questions. The, the first question is, how did you get started into midwifery? How did that happen? You know, I, it's, I feel like I could, I could answer this in so many ways, but um, one of the things that brought me to midwifery was meeting a home birth midwife when I was uh, working as a barista at Coffee Topia on Mission Street in Santa Cruz. I met Cindy Bacon there and we talked about my family history that there was midwives in my lineage and she immediately invited me to be a part of her midwifery uh, study group. Um, so that was incredible, but that was home birth. Um, and at that time it didn't seem realistic for so many reasons. So I dropped out and I didn't really know back then that there was nurse midwives until I had my daughter, until I became pregnant with my daughter in 2006. And after having her, you know, having, you know, the post-date induction, um, I realized how important it is to really try to be there for other people during those sacred moments because everyone I knew, like my friends, and family members had had really traumatic experience during childbirth. And I really felt that I really wanted to, to be a part of that experience. And um, I went back to school to do nursing prerequisites with the end goal of hopefully being able to get into a nursing midwifery program. So that's really how I ended up studying to be a CNM. Okay, so that's a hard road. So it took some time. And, uh, and then you went to school locally here for that? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I did all my nursing prerequisites at Cabrillo. Um, I was very lucky that I had been able to go to uh, a university here at UCSF. And so I had a bachelor's and the UCSF program requires a, um, a bachelor's. And then uh, you can apply to do the, it's called MEPIN. Um, I'm not sure what the M stands for right now, but it's like a, you do the RN in one year and then in the summer you take the licensing exam and then you start your master's in midwifery and women's health. Yeah. Master's entry into. Master's entry. Master's entry, yeah. Good for you. Good for you. Well, I did a similar thing but I mean, I guess we all do a similar thing. So then, but uh, aside from school, uh, Maria, you were really instrumental in setting up some community programs here. And I've been very impressed with your efforts. So which, which ones, you know, they come and they go as these things do, but which ones have been your favorites? And, and is there one that you're gonna bring out again? You have the best questions. Yes, to all of it. Um, you know, so when you asked me what 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 brought you to midwifery, um, one of the things that brought me to midwifery was um, the experiences that my family members had had being pregnant and giving birth while um, being a part of, a part of the system due to a history of substance use or incarceration or plain poverty or systemic racism. And um, so I really feel connected to the community, to the substance use community, uh, the intersection between substance use, uh, mental health, houselessness, being undocumented, being a person of color and uh, pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum period. So I feel like in essence, like although I've done little different projects, it's all the same work. Um, it's all about showing up for the most um, oppressed communities. And so 
I think well, my very first project in birth work that I helped start was the Santa Cruz Bilingual Collective, uh, Dula Collective, and that was an incredible experience. <clears throat> um, but then I started with free school and um, and then those people that started out, you know, ended up not being in, they're not birth workers right now, actually. But then I start to meet new doulas and birth workers um, who also were interested in working with this intersection of substance use and pregnancy or, you know, being Latina or, you know, not speaking English. So we, I was able to get a group of us together and then we, we came up with the name of uh, Collective Wings um, okay. for a NATO project, but it was based out of uh, the Santa Cruz Bilingual Doula Collective that started out of Janice's perinatal, the rehab mm -hmm. for pregnant women um, mm -hmm. on uh, uh, Chestnut Street in Santa Cruz. I had been working in recovery for a long time. It was my first job out of college at Youth Services. I was a substance use counselor. And then my personal experience with having many, many family members with substance use uh, and being pregnant um, really um, inspired this work. And specifically my younger sister that um, showed me so much about, um, you know, the, the power and resilience of, you know, people who, um, you know, with a little support, they can like do anything that they want. And, and, and sometimes they were not even getting a chance. Their babies were being removed instantly after childbirth. The way they were treated during childbirth was, you know, very abusive. And um, so I, I, I have, since then, I felt very, very clear that I, that's the population I want to focus on. And I found a group of doulas who also connected to this community in some way. And most of them are also people of color and bilingual. And so that's really my vision to have people from the community showing up for their own community. And right now, the only, the mo my most recent project was a Campesina womb care project and which we don't do birth work is more, um, we focus on providing support for uh, people's menstrual cycles. Um, but my dream, hopefully this year, 2020, everything is possible, um, to really start a doula program for the people that I work with currently at Salud Para La Gente. I would love to have Misteco doulas, uh, indigenous doulas. I have been training, offering trainings in Spanish, uh, doula trainings in Spanish, and also adding some of the Mexican traditional knowledge, pregnancy, birthing, postpartum knowledge. and. I really feel that there's a huge need and there are a lot of people asking to, they wanna learn. They wanna learn about their traditions. They wanna learn how to prepare for childbirth and they wanna show up for the community. I think that uh, the Campesina Womb Care Project has taught me to believe in myself and my dreams and in, in the community that we will show up for each other, that we can take care of each other when a lot of you know, organizations, institutions, or people in power are not looking out for the most vulnerable or the undocumented or the unhoused or just anyone that you know, doesn't fit in, in the um, conventional boxes. Mm -hmm. that society wants to put you in. Mm -hmm. we, it was um, introduced to me as those um, unattractive, inarticulate people <laughs> that people don't want to spend time with or, or think about them or help them. Well, um, as you know, we're, we're both headed to uh, creating doula programs here. Yes. So that's pretty exciting, um, increasing support at the bedside and labor. And um, as you know, it's it's very different. I mean, to me, you're you're not only bilingual, but you're like bi-professional or something. I don't really know the term because you know the hospital and you know the home birth scene. So I'm kind of curious uh, if you tell us a, a little bit of where you're working right now and how do you bring 
the home birth scene into the hospital. Is, is any of it possible? You know, it's so uh, just to share, I am, I just started attending births at the hospital this past year. Um, so I, I am absolutely at the very beginning of my career. It took me very long time to get here, but I'm finally here. And as a midwife, I have color, you know, I, I, um, I really struggled to complete my midwifery free education. I really had to fight for every step of the way. And it kind of feels that way as well. Uh, having like being able to acquire the privilege to attend birth at the hospital has been a huge accomplishment. I, some days I wasn't sure what was gonna happen. When I graduated school, I really thought I was gonna go straight into home birth. I was pregnant myself, planning at home birth. I had an incredible home birth experience. I've been able to support some friends. I don't have any official formal training on in home birth, but I definitely, as a pregnant and birthing per person, have done it twice. It is where I feel the most at peace and empowered and uh, connected to you know Mother Earth you know, a higher power. And I really believe that every single person deserves that experience wherever they are. All these divisions between, you know, LMs and CNMs or home birth a hospital or, or birth center are really um, difficult. And I really wish one day we can all work together that all midwives could practice in all settings or practice where they want, but that people had options that they could decide how to birth and how to, where and how to birth um, without having to worry about, you know, payment. Mm -hmm. um, because it, that's like the biggest barrier. So because I'm new at the hospital, I, um, I really, you know, just have to make sure that I'm providing the best care in terms of safety, um very um you know really good just taking really good care of people with what we have and when someone is open or has requests i am very uh, it's very important to me to honor the, those requests but as you know in the hospital it's really the labor nurse who is there most of the time we really just come when there's a need when we need to do an assessment we need to you know um, have a plan, create a plan, change plans, or if there's an emergency. But um, working with indigenous people from Mexico who uh, still speak their own original language and many of them have been given birth in their homelands, um, in their home, is so powerful to me and to be able to be there as someone that you know I don't look like them particularly but a little bit more than the other providers right I am the only <laughs> brown midwife right there <laughs> um, we do have Dr. Gamboa who's a Latina OBGYN and is amazing and then we have a Filipina OBGYN Dr. Maria Grantham and then we have Dr. Hector Magaña who's a uh, Chicano. So all that is incredible, but because I grew up in Mexico, because I was born in my home in Mexico and I've given birth at home, I, I feel very connected in that. Um, I don't know what words to use, like indigenous or traditional or just mujer a mujer way where yes, birth is instinctual yeah. and it is sacred and um, and I feel that, you know, in the few moments that I get to connect with them and provide support, I really, I really uh, try to transmit that with my energy, with my words, um, for them to be able to like instantly relax and know that I'm going to, you know, uh, help them be safe and respected and that they can ask for anything that they need. So that's really all I can do for now. But we do get occasional uh, patients from other places that are not mystic or are not Mexican and they do come with their birth plans and they know what they want and I love that that when I labor in the water um, 
And I enjoy those experiences so much. And I do everything that I can to make all our decisions together and, you know, honor their wishes and also find a middle place where we can, you know, just meet each other at a place where that feels safe and good to everyone. But, but at the end of the day, I know it's their experience mm -hmm. and um, I never try to um, disrupt or harm uh, the sacredness of birth. Mm -hmm. How has COVID been with having support people in the room for, I mean, to, can they bring a support person in the room with them now? Yes, you know, this whole pandemic experience has been central to my midwifery experience because I started practicing uh, in September of 2019. I was only doing prenatal clinic, but I was also pregnant when the pandemic started. And so uh, it worked out where I didn't stay at the hospital. Um, I only did a clinic, so I was really out of the loop and then I was on maternity for six months and then I came back and it was a different phase of the pandemic now early 2021 so since I've been there we've always had two people um so that's been it's been pretty sad I was looking forward to having births with you know a room packed of family members and children welcoming their little siblings. But of course, you know, uh, everyone is very, very understanding, very strong. And we definitely see people giving birth alone because their partner is with their older children. There's no childcare available. All the dis disparities are very um, glaring in the face every moment of it. But we find a way to just be in the moment and just tap into that sacredness of this new life coming, you know, earth side. Um, so it's been okay. The population at Watsonville Community Hospital is very, very understanding and very receptive and very cooperative. Um, so we, yeah, we're just doing the best that we can. So Maya, you know, you are a trendsetter. Uh, you saw the community involvement, you know, early, and and now it's trendy to uh, have community involvement. But you were like ahead of the ball that time. You were ahead of the concepts of working with uh, perinatal substance abuse people in a respectful way. No one else was doing that, so you were ahead of that trend. And so I think I should ask you, what trends do you see coming now down the pike or what would you like to see different? I feel that in my little time in this midwifery journey, I started school in 2013. I started the Bilingual Dual Collective in 2010 or 11. Um, and back then, I just thought we were always gonna have to do this, like, you know, like kind of hiding or like under the radar. Um, I was just so lucky that I found friends that like, you know, we shared values and views. Um, but I always felt like, even when I would attend, you know, like countywide meetings, focusing on perinatal mental health or whatever, I always felt very isolated and alone. And almost like I was crazy, like, like I, like I wasn't making sense, like I was irresponsible, like something was wrong, but I always knew that I was speaking, you know, from my heart and I, you know, grew up with, you know, in this way, knowing what it's like to be undocumented or knowing what it's like to deal with someone having an overdose <clears throat> while pregnant or things like that. So that always informed myself and kept me grounded. But now my, and so, but and along the way I found a lot of people and now like there's more and more, you know, awareness. So my dream for this year is for people to really show up, not just talk about it or not just volunteer one time, but really make long-term commitments. Um, and really for everyone, for all of us to challenge ourselves to 
get really, really, really uncomfortable and get really, really um, curious and uh, and very clear so that we can get very clear. And if we are doing this work, if you are a doula, a midwife, a doctor, a pediatrician, whoever you are, to really start working from the heart, to really, really look at someone in the face and be like, I care about you like I care for my sister, my partner, my daughter. So I'm going to listen to you. So really, I want us to form this trend where we're really listening to pregnant people, birthing people, postpartum people, children, families, and our elders as well. So that's why I'm so excited. And I really want to share a public thank you to you, Elizabeth, for becoming really my very first mentor ever in my life. I never could have ever said that. I you know, grew up without parents. So I'm really grateful to you. And I look forward to collaborating more intergenerationally, to including our children, to including our elders, and really coming together as a community. It doesn't matter, you know, if you have like, like whatever you have, whether what training you have, or if you have this, you know, organization that you work for, whatever it is, like to remove all those barriers that prevent us from really coming together and um, showing up for our community in a better way. So I really look forward. And I know that right now there's a huge surge in the pandemic. So we can't get together as we wish, but I really cannot wait for us to stay more involved via, you know, online and eventually in person to really um, just show up for each other so that when we show up to our jobs, we're not so depleted mm -hmm. and we don't start losing that connection with, you know, the sacredness of birth and each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want everyone to do what Maria thinks we should do. And we should listen to each other and, and spread the wealth of, yes. of wisdom around and compassion and, and how that works. So uh, Maria, just a little bit more, because I know you're very busy today. Um, what do you do for yourself to keep yourself going? That's such a wonderful question because I've been thinking about it a lot um, over the new year. I've been working a lot. <clears throat> so I've really been, I'm very clear that I really need to have a very good self-care routine. Um, and of course my children just fill me up with love and inspiration and you know, magic. I have my three-year-old and my one-year-old and then my 15-year-old. And we're finding a place where we're like understanding each other, like working together a little bit better. So um, what helps me stay connected is besides being with them and outdoors, you know, I we spend a lot of time at the beach or here in the forest, but also I'm very much involved in my um, circle of sisters meaning that if someone needs support, I show up. I, I offer uh, sealing ceremonies, not necessarily just for the postpartum period, but any, any, any person with a womb that would like some support in healing, cleansing their womb, or just needs any type of support. So I stay involved at, uh, leading sealing ceremonies regularly. I have met some people where we are able to do temascales once in a while. And, um, you know, body work is so important. And the other thing that I hadn't been able to do due to the pandemic was traveling. And in, August, in November, I was able to go to Mexico to work with Wirarica and Tepehuano women. And that, is really important to me to be able to reconnect with my homeland and be of service down there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're a bi-professional, bilingual and bi-country, I think. You're a, mix of, you're a mix of places and that's good And because a lot of people are. I think one of the best things that you do is that you show others that they, they can do it too. Yes, absolutely. And, and the trajectory may not be so straight for some of us. And you may not fit in and you may not be understood. Yeah. And it's okay. 
um, because as long as you follow your heart and your spirit and listen to the people, um, you're going to be taking, you're going to be protected, taken care of, and, you know, blessings are going to show up. Like I feel like I have been receiving a lot of blessings and, um, it's been the most incredible experience to feel this way now after going through such a difficult mm -hmm. experience in my training to finally be practicing and really good things coming and you know being or starting to earn a little respect and experience it just gets me so excited for what is possible in a few years that's great Maria and it is true um we have to allow people to go a slightly crooked path to get to where they want to. It's not everything gets done in four years. And it took me seven years to get my undergraduate degree. But, you know, some of us are kind of like that a little bit. That's how it takes. Well, um, I promised we would be done about now. So we're going to have to let you go. But I want to thank you very much for your sharing of your great wisdom and about you and how much I just I'm I don't think I'm gonna cry exactly, but <laughs> I am just so taken that of your big heart and how you seem to never get tired doing these hard things and how much the community needs you and how much the community owes to you. So thank you very much. And we will probably take some uh, questions offline. Uh, and uh, we'll get you to connect with some questions from our audience. Uh, and is there a way that people could contact you if they wanted to contact you through one of your organizations? Yes, I do have a very old website for Collective Wings. Um, and I do not have a website for Campesina Womb Project, but you could find me on Instagram. I am called Como Te Amo Midwifery. Oh, wow. Or Campesina with an X, Campesina X Womb Care Project. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. And here's a shout out to all these projects. Uh, they, they need some financial support, people. So uh, hope you take down those numbers. All right, Maria. Thank you very, thank very you. much for uh, coming today and speaking to us. And um, I wish you all the best that's possible. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome.